And now we are going to move on to really one of the highlights of our meeting, our Morton Lecture. I want to introduce first, for all of you who do not know who Dr. Morton was, um, a brief uh, biography of the um, uh, named lecture. Uh, Robert Morton was born in Mississippi in 1913. Actually, if you could advance the slide, I'd appreciate it. Uh, he attended Millsap College in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, maybe actually go back one slide. Thanks. Um, and then went on to study medicine at the University of Tennessee, where he earned the degree of MD in 1938. This was followed by radiology training at the Mayo Clinic from 1938 to 1941. His first practice was at the Scott and White Clinic in Temple, Texas, where he remained until 1950. He joined the Bond Group in Fort Worth, where he practiced until 1965. During this time, he was on the clinical faculty at Southwestern Medical School. In 1965, he joined the staff of the MD Anderson Hospital and remained there until 1984. Dr. Morton made significant contributions to GI radiology. He was active in statewide health issues and was appointed by six different governors to significant voluntary positions. He served for 24 years on the Texas Board of Health. In 1988, a new building in Austin was named in his honor. He was active in the Texas Radiologic Society and was president of the TRS at the time of the 39th annual meeting held in Houston in 1952. He was awarded the gold medal in 1974. He also received the gold medal of the RSNA in 1973 and the gold medal of the ACR in 1992. Dr. Morton was a board member of the John S. Dunn Research Foundation, a large philanthropic group. In 1944, he married his wife and lifelong companion, Alma. Dr. Morton passed away at age 79 in 1992. After his death, the John S. Dunn Research Foundation donated grants to the TRS and the American College of Radiology to underwrite an annual Robert D. and Alma Morton lectureship. Now I would like to introduce our Morton speaker. Uh, our topic is Value, Variation, and Patient-Centered Care, Building Radiology's Future by Dr. Brent James. Now, I have been very fortunate in that I have been a, um, a recipient of his course and got to know him, uh, and I have uh, the utmost regard for him. Uh, his, his teaching and quality and safety is known worldwide, um, and I have learned a great deal from him. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Brent James is the Chief Quality Officer and Executive Director at the Institute for Healthcare Delivery Research at Intermountain Healthcare, which is an integrated system of 23 hospitals, 200 clinics, and a 900-plus member physician group. It's based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Through the Intermountain Advanced Training Program in Clinical Practice Improvement, or for short, called the ATP course, which I attended. He has trained almost 5,000 senior physicians, nursing and administrative executives drawn from around the world in clinical management methods with proven uh, improvement results and nearly 50 daughter training programs in eight countries. Dr. James is known internationally for his work in clinical quality improvement, patient safety, and the infrastructure that underlies successful improvement efforts, such as culture change, data systems, payment methods, and management roles. I will tell you that he certainly has the ear of all of our health policy makers in Washington. Dr. James is a fellow of the American College of Physician Executives and a member of the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine. He holds faculty appointments at the University of Utah School of Medicine, the Harvard School of Public Health, and the University of Sydney, Australia School of Public Health. He has been honored with a series of awards for quality and healthcare delivery, including most recently the 2011, or yeah, 2011 Edward Deming Award from Columbia University School of Business and the 2010 C. Jackson Grayson Medal, Distinguished Quality Pioneer of the American Quality and Productivity Center. Prior to coming to Intermountain Healthcare, Dr. James was an assistant professor in the Department of Biostatistics at the Harvard School of Public Health, and he staffed the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer. 
Dr. James has been named among modern physicians' 50 most influential physician executives in healthcare. He has also been named among the 100 most powerful people in healthcare and among the 25 top clinical informaticists in healthcare. Dr. James completed his bachelor's medical degree and master's of statistics degree at the University of Utah. We are honored to have Dr. James deliver this year's Morton Lecture on the topic value, variation, and patient-centered care, building radiology's future. Dr. Brent James. Thank you very much, Dr. Applegate. Uh, a joy to see you again. Another one of my students who made good. You know, um, it's been over 25 years ago that I left the fair city of Boston, Massachusetts to travel to Salt Lake City. Um, my office was in the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I was mostly associated with the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group over GI tumors for that institution. It was fun to hear the review today to see ECOG and RTOG and CLBG still pushing along. When I arrived in Salt Lake City, I encountered a group who was interested in a relatively nascent topic. They wanted to study variation in practice. Fairly extensive literature at the time, but almost all of the studies had looked at hospitalization rates, how often people were hospitalized with particular conditions. They wanted to drive it a layer deeper. They said, imagine that we have similar patients admitted to our hospitals. Do we treat them the same? Uh, I jokingly say that the people involved after 25 years have probably forgiven me for what I did to them. I complexified their life immeasurably. Insisted, for example, that we measure every comorbid illness for those patients on admission to the hospital and individually stage each. Every complication stage that. Long-term outcomes stage that. Severity of presenting symptoms. We ended up, though, with a group of patients that, so far as we could tell, were statistically identical coming in and going out. Ar argued that that was the only circumstance in which it was really fair to look at the processes of care. Oh, they had a system for tracking those processes. Complexified that too. They hadn't asked the physicians and nurses who delivered the care to come together and identify those factors that they regarded as critical. Well, we did that and ended up with a rigorous study design that allowed us to track the details of care delivery. Short answer to our findings, massive variation. Just as a quick illustration, this is the first topic we addressed, transurethral prostatectomy. Very common procedure at the time. 16 urologists within the Intermountain system who saw statistically meaningful numbers of cases. The little green squares show true surgical cut time. The little red circles, grams of prostatic tissue removed. Now, I trained originally in surgery, and I was just flummoxed. I was amazed. The longer you operated, the less tissue you removed. But the variation was what was truly impressive. For example, in surgical cut times, it ranges from a high of 90 minutes to complete the procedure on median to a low of 38 minutes. That's more than a two-and-a-half-fold difference in carefully balanced patients. Grams of prostatic tissue Physician G, 13 grams per patient to a high. Physician J, 42 grams. That's more than a threefold difference. And this was typical across every condition, every specialty that we observed. Massive physician to physician variation. It impacted cost of operations as well. Intermountain runs a true activity based costing system and has for several decades. So we have accurate measures of true cost. Physician M, $1,164 to get a good outcome on a standard case. H was high, $2,233, twice as much money for the same patient with the same outcome. Of course, this is what interested the administrators, as you might expect. Some other very interesting findings. It would be easy to look at that slide and say, well, M's an excellent performer and H is a poor performer. But when you looked at the detailed data, that did not hold true. This is a summary slide that's pulling together about 45 cost-related factors. Yeah, M on average was very efficient. The trouble was he had four or five things where he was actually the worst in the group. H appeared to be a fairly heavy utilizer. Trouble was he had three or four things where he was the best in the group. 
And if you looked at the detailed data for any length of time at all, you walked away convinced it wasn't a matter of choosing the best surgeon. That almost certainly best care for a patient was scattered across the group, as subsequent investigation clearly demonstrated. It forced us to a process level focus as opposed to a person level focus. Instead of focusing on good physician, bad physician, what is the best way to perform this procedure for patients who would benefit from it? That's what we did. We took these data and fed them back to the physicians involved. Of course, had to go through a little debate about whether the data were accurate, resolved that. But then the idea that one of your colleagues is doing it differently and appears to be getting a good result. Over a period of time, what we saw were massive reductions in variation. This slide is something called a statistical process control chart. It's for the third thing we measured, total hypothroplasty. It's one of more than 100 factors we were tracking, but it's illustrative. The variation across this group of five orthopedic surgeons at one hospital is re represented by the distance from that center green line each year up to the red dotted line. And the thing to observe is as the variation declined, it fell by more than a third. In fact, by 1990, to the far right of that graph, we could no longer measure physician to physician variation. And this happened not just with this particular factor, but across essentially all factors associated with the care. It's almost as if those surgeons, completely on their own, were creating a protocol, a standard approach to care on the fly. Uh, most times it was associated with fairly dramatic decreases in resource utilization. Not always. I have some where it was stable, some where it actually went up a bit. But on average, it greatly reduced the cost of care. In fact, this slide right here, this is the one that changed Intermountain. To that time, the administration of Intermountain was regarding me as a fairly typical academic researcher. These studies were expensive. In today's dollars, over $100,000 to conduct the studies, and it was done on internal money. But when they saw this one, showing that the cost of a total hip dropped from about $13,000 per case to about $8,000 per case with a better clinical outcome, suddenly the conversation shifted dramatically from, you're going to spend how much to do another one of these things, to how fast do you think you can do how many of these? <laughs> now, we fairly quickly exhausted a critical resource. We quickly ran out of clinical topics where I had a sufficient volume of patients per physician to use this massively statistical approach. We were hunting a new study design and stumbled across it by pure serendipity. The year was 1991. A researcher at our flagship LDS hospital, a big quaternary level teaching hospital, Dr. Alan Morris, had been studying acute respiratory distress syndrome without going into the details of that disease, most of you are familiar with it, we'd participated in a large multi-center randomized controlled trial for something called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, ECMO, artificial lung for treating these patients. That trial did not show a patient benefit. So we had abandoned ECMO for adults. It works in neonates, but not for adults. When a group in Milan, Italy, well, they met in Milan, from northern Italy came up with a modification of ECMO called ECOR, extracorporeal CO2 removal. It had modified the artificial lung. They had a few patients, less than five, that they'd tried this technology on. No evidence of benefit, but a question, does a complete lack of evidence of benefit, has that ever stopped a red-blooded American physician from adopting a new technology? <laughs> Especially if it kind of makes physiologic sense and potentially could work, yeah. Well, it was showing widespread uptake across the United States, despite a complete lack of evidence. What Dr. Morris did was get a large NIH grant, National Heart and Lung Blood Institute, to do a randomized controlled trial of this therapy. Treatment arm, the new Italian artificial lung, ECOR, control arm, standard ventilator management of these patients. When we ran into a real problem, you see, part of our group had been studying variation and for the first time, somebody said, I wonder if the eight academic intensivists in our level one trauma unit, shock trauma respiratory ICU, where we treat these patients, I wonder if they set ventilators the same. Now, prior to this time, there was an assumption. I mean, 
ventilator management, some of our best evidence in medicine comes in respiration, pulmonary function. We modeled it quite accurately. And there was just an assumption that highly trained academic intensivists would all manage a ventilator about the same, ideal care. Well, we thought we ought to check. Short version, we documented massive variation from physician to physician in how they set a ventilator based upon a patient's physiologic data twice a day, morning to night rounds. It even went a step further. This is the first time when we were able to document massive variation, same attending physician, same patient, literally morning to night rounds. Massive variation in how ventilators were set. By the way, the answer turned out to be complexity. Turns out there's a literature that demonstrates that the expert mind can consider a maximum of about nine factors. It actually says five to nine factors when making a clinical decision. Unfortunately, for ventilator settings, there are about 40 major classes of physiologic data that you should consider, and 40 is more than nine. <laughs> In fact, when we encountered that evidence, it turns out if you just looked backwards and just assumed that each time that expert intensivist had seen the patient, that they were subconsciously and by their own evaluation at random, more on that in a moment, selecting six or seven or eight factors to optimize, if you played it backwards, you could completely explain their ventilator settings. Yeah, a little complexity problem. Well, we know how to deal with that in trials. You build a protocol into the arms of a trial. So we set out to build a protocol for ventilator management for the first time. Well, we were fairly naive. We assumed that we could just go to the scientific literature and find the answers in the published literature. Wow, was that ever a surprise? We could find about 20% of what we needed, just in passing. There's a fairly wide literature around that topic today as well. We have evidence for best practice about 15 to 25% of the time across the house of medicine. 75 to 85 percent of the time, physicians and nurses can hold legitimate differences of opinion about what's best because there is no evidence. And we do. Shows up as massive variation. By the way, when I say evidence, I'm willing to accept level three evidence. That means expert consensus opinion from a group of respected authorities using formal methods in a published form. I'm not insisting on randomized controlled trials here. And I would argue that level three, that's pretty soft, but even at that evidentiary standard, we could find evidence about 20% of the time. You see, we were familiar with the difficulties of protocol development, just to list a few. In most circumstances, we don't have evidence for best practice. There's a similar body of evidence that shows that expert consensus, level three evidence, is unreliable. It depends on who you ask and the way you ask. Different specialties, different individuals, you can get radically different protocols for best care. Yeah, a third body of evidence shows that when you publish a guideline, then deploy it to the profession, your physicians will say it was valuable. They'll tell you that they learned a lot, that they've changed their practice. The wheels come off when you measure whether they changed their practice, and a fairly extensive literature shows that they don't. Um, no change in practice. The last one on the list, though, is I think the most important one today. I won't go into details, but there's a body of evidence that shows that, well, it shows something that you already know from experience. No, no two patients are the same. I, I'm going to say it a particular way. I don't think I can write a protocol that perfectly fits any patient. Well, wait a minute. It's not just that I don't think. I think I've got strong evidence that I can't write a protocol that perfectly fits any patient with some exceptions. There are relatively rare exceptions where the science is nailed down tight. Well, we knew this going in. And because of that, Dr. Morris chose to use his new protocol in a fairly unique way. The year before a new book had appeared, it was by a guy named Womack. It was called The Machine That Changed the World. It's the first text that laid out a method called lean in quality theory. One of the three legs of lean is something called mass customization. That was the key idea behind it. Well, here's how it works. Um, 
just to jump to the chase. We call them shared baseline, lean protocols. Sometimes they're called bundles. You identify a high priority clinical process. You build an evidence-based best practice protocol despite their many limitations. It's never going to be perfect. You just have to kind of come close enough. The next thing you do is you blend it into clinical workflows. There's a literature that shows that if I rely upon memory, even among highly intelligent, deeply dedicated, massively overeducated <laughs> physicians and nurses, that I will be able to execute correctly around 50% of the time in a complex environment. This is Beth McGlynn's work at RAND primarily. Well, you blend it into clinical workflow so that people don't have to remember. It's automatic. Standing order sets, uh, checklists, clinical flow sheets of various sorts, what we call action lists, patient worksheets. We have a whole series of tools we use for that so that it's not memory supported. It, another name for that is clinical decision support. Properly done. Step number four, you embed data systems into the flow of work with two primary purposes. The first, we're going to need to track every time somebody chooses to vary from the protocol. That's going to turn out to be critical. It's coming up in the next step. When somebody varies, I need to know that they varied from protocol. And number two, I need to know what happened to the patient. So here's some jargon. I need short-term and long-term, also known as intermediate and final, clinical cost and service outcomes. And you embed them into the workflows of the care. Number five. The interesting part, this is the mass customization part. Here's how I say it to my colleagues inside Intermountain. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not that we allow or even that we encourage. We demand that you modify our shared baseline protocol based upon individual patient need. I have hard evidence that they never perfectly fit any patient. That's why we have you. I need an expert at the point of contact that adjusts. Now, Having about 60 of these running under formal measurement, I can tell you that you'll vary about 5 to 15% of the time. 95% confidence interval. Most of the time you can follow the protocol, but some of the time you have to vary. In a very real sense, these are the opposite of cookbook medicine. They take your most important resource, that trained expert mind, and focus it on a relatively narrow band of issues, well, they have to choose what varies and how it varies. But then step six, you do it in the context of what's called a lean learning loop. There's some more jargon. Data feedback relatively rapidly to show you when you vary consequences for patients across the group. Just to illustrate, this is what it looked like when we did this for ARDS. Dr. Morris tried this first on patient number 29 in the series of ventilated ARDS patients they were tracking. In that patient, they followed protocol recommendations 41% of the time, more than half the time. Those clinicians varied from protocol. It took them eight patients, about four months, before they first went over 90% compliance. Now, lesson number one from this, in those four months, they put more than 125 changes into their guideline. Arguably, even to this day, this is the finest evidence-based best practice protocol I have seen in my life. They took more than a year to build it. They involved experts from around the world, formal methods, nominal group technique, Delphi methods to create it, as good as I've ever seen in a career of randomized controlled trials. That abstract document changed wholesale when it hit reality in real patient care, and that has been typical for every one of these we've ever built. Second thing to take away from this slide, count for me the number of patients where they followed 100% of the protocol recommendations. Oh, it's zero. This particular protocol is used across ARDSnet, 16 big academic centers that study this disease together. We have more than 100 big ICUs who use the same protocol. They're just not part of ARDSnet. Literally thousands of patients through this thing. To my knowledge, we have yet to have a single patient where they've been able to follow 100% of the guideline instructions. An illustration of what I mentioned earlier, I don't think you can write a protocol that perfectly fits any patient at least for any part of medicine that's interesting or challenging, where, where you need these things the most, you see. Oh, what happened when we did that? Survival rates among ECMO entry criteria, 
ARDS patients improved from 9.5% to 44%. We saw more than a four and a half fold improvement in survival rates. First time since ARDS was defined as a syndrome in the 1960s that anyone had shown an improvement in clinical outcomes and it was a dramatic improvement. We then deployed it across ARDSnet and validated this finding on a broad scale, fundamentally redefining this disease. This is a real summary of the idea that somehow those intensivists were subconsciously recognizing the right factors to optimize. Some people argued, well, I don't know how I picked them, but somehow along the line, somewhere God changed my brain and I just recognized the things that are really important this time, this day. But as measured in patient outcomes, doing it in a consistent way was far more important than that intuition. Just in passing, cost of care fell by about 25%. That's a very common finding, more on that in a moment. Interestingly, physician time fell by about 50%. That's been another common finding. These approaches tend to massively improve physician productivity. I mean, it means you can see more patients, generate more income. More on that in a moment as well. Key takeaways, no protocol perfectly fits any patient with a solution, a shared baseline bundle. Number two, various serious limitations to protocol development. Well, build a learning system. It's a homing missile. It doesn't matter much where you start. If you have those data feeding back and a thoughtful clinical group following up, you'll get to best care. If I have several groups at different institutions developing this sort of best care, I establish the foundation for a truly effective research group as well. And step three, reliance on human memory produces about 55% execution. We show high 90s when we start to blend these protocols into clinical workflows with associated significant improvements in patient outcomes. Now, interestingly, I'll come back to this too. I think I learned most of this in residency at a principal level. It only requires coordinated teams and a reliable data system. Those are the only two things that it really requires, true transparency of our treatment choices and what happens when we make those choices. Um, let me say it more explicitly, and I'll warn you in advance, I'm gonna come back and say this to you as radiologists. Ladies and gentlemen, it's more important you do it the same than that you do it right, well, well, right. How do we come up with that idea of right? Based on my personal experience, level four evidence, anecdotal in my experience, my personal favorite approaches, you see. Trick is, is if you'll do it the same, your error rates will fall, your costs will fall, but most important, it establishes a foundation for scientific investigation. It's the same idea that underlies the use of protocols in the arms of randomized controlled trials. It just takes that idea and puts it into routine care. Yes, you're right. It means that you can generate valid research from routine care at a much higher rate and at a much lower cost. But that's not my topic for the day, although it really is a fun topic. Can I just illustrate it to you? It turns out the most common cause of death in U.S. hospitals today is sepsis, body-wide infection. A few years ago, back in 2007, Dr. Terry Klemmer, one of our senior intensivists, one of the founders of intensive care medicine, and Dr. Todd Allen, one of our ER physicians, decided to focus on that topic. More than half of these patients enter your hospital through your emergency room. They put together a bundle, moderately complex, 13 major elements in it. The blue line shows ER compliance over time. The red line is ICU compliance. The yellow is in total. It rises from about 30% compliance up to about 90 today. Now, nationwide mortality rates for sepsis range from about 20 to 50%. This is a deadly, deadly disease. When we started in Intermountain, we were among the best of the best. We had a 20.2% mortality rate in this class of patients. Oh, I checked before coming out in the last three years, the rate's never gone above 8%. Now that's about 125 more lives per year in Intermountain. Oh, the trick, I have more than 100 of these. I can document more than 1,000 lives per year of people that a few years ago in the Intermountain system would have died, who don't today. 
the major takeaway, we count our successes in lives. This fundamentally changes the level of services that physicians, nurses, well, the whole health system in Intermountain can deliver to the communities we serve. We count our successes in lives, and that's the tip of the iceberg. For every life saved, hundreds of lives, suffering reduced, function improved. Well, meeting the core goals of our profession. Can I show you one more example very quickly? It has to do with the cost side of the equation. Back in 1987, based upon that original QUE studies where I started with you, I met a fellow named Deming. Deming had transformed manufacturing, and he supplied quality improvement theory. He gave us the theory to understand what we were seeing. One of Deming's most interesting findings, he claimed and showed evidence to support that in most circumstances, not all, but most, as you improve, well, in our world, a clinical outcome, higher quality, it nearly always drives down your cost of operations, he argued. We showed that, started to use it. A few years later, Dr. Lucy Savitz and I got a little grant from AHRQ. We took Deming's models of waste, anything that did not fully take advantage of that relationship. Any time where you had a quality failure that costs more, Deming labeled it waste, and it turns out to be a very broad definition. We came up with a six-part model. We could identify national estimates for two of our six pieces. The other four were non-trivial. On the basis of those two alone, we estimated that more than 50% of all money spent in healthcare today is technically waste. I'm talking 50% of a $2.6 trillion budget this year. When President Obama says the key to the U.S. economy is healthcare, he is exactly correct, at least from our way of looking at it. I, I recently served on another IOM committee. We estimated 35%. They didn't include all the elements in my model, and frankly, 35%, 50%. It wasn't worth arguing at that point. So we posted that figure to the profession with some fairly solid backup behind it. Why is that important? Well, it has to do with this. It's called the fiscal gap. It's the difference between the commitments the United States government has made to the people of this country and their funding. So this isn't the total cost. This is just the gap. Arguably the best analyst in Washington today, well, just retired, actuary at the Medicare program at CMS, he puts that gap at $211 trillion using what's called a net present value. That means that you massively discount the costs as you go out in time. How much would I have to have now for that money down the road? $211 trillion. Well, that's just a big number. To put it in perspective, the present value of the United States of America, all public and private, intellectual and physical property, your cars, your homes, the clothes you're wearing, my glass of Diet Coke, all of it, about 75 trillion. Technically, the government of the United States is bankrupt. I, I mean, not just morally. Uh, <laughs> and politically, <laughs> but financially <laughs> as well. There you go. Two-thirds of the shortfall is the Medicare program by itself. Size of these bubbles is accurate. Two-thirds of it's the Medicare program. We have met the enemy. He is us. For those of you who are into real policy wonkish activities, Turns out that the ACA, the federal health reform law, contains some projections of reduced payments to physicians and hospitals to make this financially viable. That line diving down is labeled Medicare. It does protect Medicaid. PHI, the top line, is private health insurance. But in order to make those budgets appear to balance to pass that legislation, they made assumptions that payments for Medicare patients would decrease at the rate shown. That right around 2017, in theory, the payments for Medicare patients would fall below payments for Medicaid patients, you see. Now, none of us believe this is real. There's a political reality behind this, too, and that's one of the reasons you're here in Washington. On the other hand, there is a financial reality behind it. 
and we're seeing it play out across the caring professions, across the healthcare industry, an era of focus on cost that beggars everything before. And there is a financial reality. You probably live it as I do every day. Now, there are a couple of different ways of thinking about this. I'm going to label them focus on the top line versus focus on the bottom line. Focus on the top line. The way that we made money in medicine, the way that we met budgets, created what are called operating margins to keep our institutions alive, our practices alive, provide more service, change the nature of the service, increase reimbursement for those services. That's the top line focus. You try to increase revenues is your main strategy. I've labeled it some ways. Ride this horse till it drops is what I hear from a number of practice groups. We understand that that thing is dead. Probably in the next few years, but I'm close to retirement. I'll milk it for all it's worth and then I'll wave goodbye. Build market power, consolidate so that you can better negotiate with purchasers. Uh, form basically a monopoly so that we can set any price we'd like if they want our services. Compete very vigorously for fee-for-service cases. Include things like medical tourism. Um, enhance revenues in other ways um, for top-end fee-for-service products. Build independent fee-for-service imaging centers, for example. Uh, seek political protections. Um, that would be called any willing provider legislation so that you can charge whatever you'd want to patients and some third party will pay it, you see. Those are some of the strategies associated with focus on the top line. Focus on the bottom line. You assume that your revenues are capped. In that environment, your financial salvation depends entirely on being able to manage your costs. Well, a better way of saying it, being able to eliminate waste. That $1.3 trillion in waste, somebody's going to figure that out. They're going to figure out how to extract that waste and then monetize it. And whoever does that is going to do very, very well indeed, at the great expense of those who can't. We've seen this story play out any number of times in other parts of the U.S. economy. This one offers no real questions except how and when. It certainly will happen. You know, recently, Dr. John Noseworthy, the new CEO of Mail, well, upon being installed in that role, he launched a committee to do a careful strategic analysis. He reported this out a few months ago. He really tiered out healthcare delivery into three tiers, down at the bottom, primary care. He said that he thought in the next five years that almost all primary care will move to capitation. The next layer was typical hospital and specialty care. The moral equivalent of capitation at that specialty level is called bundled payment where you pay a bundled price for all services, including professional fees, on a per case basis. Think of it as an extended DRG. Well, he chose to focus, at least Mayo Rochester, on that peak of the pyramid, what he called complex care. Diagnostically difficult, exclusionally challenging care. He said he thought it would be one or two percent of total care delivery, <laughs> where you could still make fee-for-service margins. Oh, Mayo estimated that the United States of America, with in-migration for medical tourism, could support about five destination medical centers. And he's targeted Mayo to become a destination medical center. This may be a little overly dramatic in terms of the size of the thing, but on the other hand, he got the main gist of it just right in terms of where our professions are headed. You see, he's, he's really identified Mayo, at least part of their business, the Mayo Clinic itself. Now, this is not the Mayo Healthcare System, which are their 18 hospitals and associated physician networks outside of Rochester. Well, Arizona and Florida are part of the Rochester group, too. But this is those hospitals in the Mayo Health System in Wisconsin and Minnesota. They live in the bottom two tiers of that. Well, that's where I live. And I would suggest to you that that's where essentially all of us live, in those bottom two tiers. Can we count on a top-line strategy into the future? Almost certainly not. That's the financial reality behind it. Um, yeah, that complex care is for people who can afford private jets. And that's a very small part of our care delivery business. 
Just an example, though, based upon that. This was work that was done by Dr. Elizabeth Hammond. She was chief of surgical pathology. I use surgical pathology so it's not illustrative, but not quite as directly to the heart. Some years ago, she came through my course on the advanced training program for clinical practice improvement. She picked a project. One of the ways I suggest that people do that is to pick their biggest hassle. What's your biggest annoyance in your daily work? And Liz decided it was phone calls from physicians for whom she had prepared a surgical pathology report. Interrupted her work, took half hour, 40 minutes to deal with. She had to go hunt up the slides, hunt up the initial report, wherever it was, track down the physician at that point, consult with them on the phone while she looked at the slides. She built a very simple data system. It was a piece of type paper next to her secretary's phone. She was the department chair. And all of those phone calls came through Liz's secretary. And she just said, anytime somebody calls and has a question about a path report, tally down that we got another one, then I want to know why. Why are they calling? A few weeks of data showed her that, well, about 80% of the phone calls coming back in, the cause was um, the path report was missing critical information necessary to plan the patient's care. Another 10%, the dictation was confusing. Physician trying to use that information couldn't figure out what the pathologist meant and had to call in with the question. Oh, it turns out that about one in two of the path reports they were producing had these sorts of problems. Now she decided to focus in on breast cancer. It's just a tight focus at the time. Her solution, turns out there was a literature for something called synoptic elements sat down with her colleagues in pathology and they hammered out a list of factors that were critical in a breast cancer pathology report. It's not all inclusive, some things take longer testing, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor status, for example, that's why they're not on the list. Real issues with it. When I was practicing surgical oncology, for example, see that one histologic grade? There are three different histologic grading systems. I, as a practicing physician, had to know all three. The reason is, is different individuals in our pathology team had their personal favorite. They had to know one, I had to know all three. What's wrong with this picture? Speaking as a surgeon, the person who uses the data, what's wrong with this? Well, they settled on one. As a group, they decided that that professional variation was not defensible. They fought it through and settled on one histologic staging system. All right, I won't go through all the other fun things they did behind it in the quality improvement setting. Short answer though, here's an example of a real report. Oh, trouble is I can't write a protocol that perfectly fits any patient. See that section at the bottom called additional comments? That's where people get to add the uniqueness of a particular case but it meant that I could find exactly what I needed in a definable location, a standard format every time. Oh, this is what allowed us to fully put our surgical pathology systems on an electronic medical record. This is the structure that this gave to the data. Hugely popular with our oncologists. Hugely popular. Meanwhile, back in the pathology department, it was associated with a dramatic drop in phone calls back to pathologists. Oh, you want to hear the really funny thing? If you followed Liz's synoptic elements, your dictation was faster. And when we automated it on the computer, faster still, it gave me the foundation for research because I had pathology information in the consumable form for doing research. That was very, very attractive. Um, and a major improvement in productivity of the pathology department because our pathologists were not spending time on the phone answering physician questions that they should never have had to ask. You see? Now they still get some phone calls, but they're the diagnostically difficult questions where you really have issues to deal with. Yeah, both productivity and satisfaction increased Time required to produce a surgical pathology report declined significantly. Frontline physicians using the reports could find what they needed in an understandable, predictable form and location. Massively popular, again, with the oncologists. Frontline physician time spent clarifying confusion reports declined too. That's one of the reasons it was so popular. 
Liz is a delightful person. But you just as soon get what you need in the initial report as having to call her up and have a conversation. You see? And then pathology time to produce those reports fell dramatically as well. Lesson number two. Turns out that better care is very often cheaper care. I've got more than 100 of these examples too. In Inner Mountain, I can document more than $300 million per year in variable cost savings that arose because we improved our clinical results. And when I talked about Dr. Morris's shared baseline protocols, that has been the key. The reason I wanted to show you the pathology results is because it applies across the house of medicine, so far as we can tell. Not just in direct patient care. Not just for you, um, well, radiology when you're doing procedures, but also radiology when you're choosing and evaluating exams. Fundamental shift in focus, in other words, in the past, type volume revenue enhancement, quality defined as regulatory compliance. In the future, we think that this kind of process management, quality in other words, is going to become the core business of any good healthcare delivery group where you focus on bottom line cost control and waste elimination. In fact, Intermountain as a system has made a decision that we are going to shift exclusively to capitated care. The reason is, is it insulates us from the federal government and their financial problems. The main reason, though, is, is that we think we know how to manage care. A fundamental difference from when this happened back in the 90s, their insurance companies tried to manage care dead from the get-go, fairly obviously, exactly how much care do those insurance companies actually deliver. And if you said zero, you got the answer right. None at all. The fundamental shift that's taking place, though, rather than asking insurance companies to manage the care and act as a middleman, we're taking them out of the middle, clinical groups managing the care together as teams. Process management's really the key to it. High quality drives lower costs on a broad scale. Under provider at risk payment models, all of the savings come back to the clinical care delivery group. In fact, we think it's our financial salvation that increase in physician productivity is waste elimination. We think it's the only way we're going to protect physician salaries and, frankly, hospital operations moving into the future. Now, the truth is, is more than half of the savings take the form of unused capacity. It empties out hospital beds. You have fewer images to perform, but it will be balanced by increasing demand. The baby boom in their chronic disease years, some population level epidemics like obesity, continued increases in technology. I'm not sure exactly how the balance will strike. Well, one of the things I believe is that we don't really need to train a whole bunch of new specialists or new physicians in general. That with a well-designed system that our current workforce could probably handle most of that load. Increased productivity is a way of maintaining our financial viability. It does require a major financial model shift. And the key difference, the key difference of all, it takes a team. Now, funny thing, I would argue to you that there's really nothing new here. In thinking back, I learned the principles of this as a surgical resident. In a standard case, when I was practicing, so long ago it doesn't count, by the way, guys. I've been so long out of real practice. Well, I still have the attitude. I just don't have the skills, you know. <laughs> Once a surgeon, always a surgeon. Fair enough. Um, I expected in the middle of the case, though, to reach my hand back and have my scrub nurse slap the right instrument into my hand because that's where we were in the case. I mean, without a word being said, I did it the same way every time, and that was drilled into my soul as good surgical practice. The reason is it made me faster, which was important when you have someone under anesthesia. It means I didn't forget things. My chances of making mistakes fell. That uh, routinization is a way of dealing with complexity. Uh, if something went seriously south and got exciting, I needed to know where everything was. And that was just good practice. I've watched my colleagues and the other specialties do exactly the same thing. My internist colleagues have standard workups for common presentations that they use the same exact way. This is not a new idea within medicine. 
there are only two new ideas here at all. The first is, is that instead of you having yours, you having yours, you having yours, me having mine, that we come together as a group, drive up our sample size, create a learning system where we can learn together from one another. I think you'll discover, as we did, that it's not a matter of picking the best position, that in this setting, everybody has a something, little something to teach, everybody has a little something to learn. A new, new level for the entire profession. I've observed it massively strengthen the profession through that mechanism. Frankly, when we get our act together on this sort of stuff, nobody can stand against us as the healing professions working together. Of course, the other thing it requires is a much better level of data system, if you see that idea. Well, I wanted to leave you with that idea. Are they perfect? Heavens no. But my favorite way of thinking about this, the reason we call it quality improvement is because better has no limit. We inherited a set of problems from our professional progenitors, and we've worked diligently to solve them. We've taken that next step, but isn't that the task of every generation of the healing professions to take the next step? I'm perfectly happy to agree that we're creating a new set of problems for the next generation, but they're far better problems than we ourselves received. That's the task of every generation of the healing professions. I would close by saying, what a glorious time to be in medicine. We're achieving levels of care that have never been conceived before. We have not yet begun to understand how good we can be for our patients and our greatest need. But it demands a new approach. It demands new and better thinking. It demands an ability to change and create a new future. And with that, let me say thanks for your time and attention, and hopefully time for a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. James. I want to have a few minutes for people to come to the microphone. We don't have a lot of time. I know we're a little bit behind, but does anyone want to come and ask Dr. James or comment on, comment on some of these thoughts? I think they, they uh, resonate with our Imaging 3.0 initiative, which we're going to hear a little bit about, and also uh, with our discussion about standardization and our guidelines efforts in quality and safety. Microphone five. The relationship between standardization and destruction of uh, innovation. Uh, it turns out that to innovate, you have to be able to tell if a change was an improvement. Within our system, this has massively accelerated innovation, especially in formal structures. Now, I work for a community system mostly. My best clinical development team, because they have the data transparency, how to say it, I justify the expense of putting that in place by performance. Intermountain's background mission is the best medical result at the lowest necessary cost for the communities that we, we serve. We built them, I justified the investment, which is not inconsequential on the basis of performance along those lines. But it turns out I created in doing that a research framework. My best team, I've got 60 of them again, but it was uh, Bob Christensen, NICU development team, last year 25 peer-reviewed publications. A couple of them seminal breakthroughs in a single year out of a community-based system. My goal before I retire is to see Intermountain produce more than 1,000 peer-reviewed publications in a single year, and that is not unreasonable. It turns out to innovate, you have to be able to tell if a change was an improvement, and it's creating that environment. Otherwise, you can't innovate, you see. So, in fact, it accelerates innovation. Alan. Thank you very much for helping us to uh, start to shift or continue to shift our paradigm. Uh, one reason it's been so great to be a physician up until this point, has, especially as a radiologist, has been that we've helped to innovate so much that we have uh, brought new ways of looking at patients and looking at care. One of the great frustrations that we have in radiology now is that we are continuing to do that, but we, bu but we run, run up against some pretty big barriers that are more focused on short-term cost savings than long-term benefits. And I guess the, probably the poster child for that would be CT colonography, uh -huh. where just about every article that's come out recently has shown the benefit, but we continue to have problems getting payers, CMS, and others mm -hmm. to, to adopt it because of the concern about overutilization of imaging. Yeah. Do you have any, any thoughts on how we can help get the message across that ev using evidence-based medicine that uh, we cannot 
stifle innovation? You know, um, being a non-radiologist, not an expert, just an idea, I know how that would play out inside the Intermountain system. We have been investing heavily in clinical leadership. In the past, you really had administrations that focused at a departmental level using financial measures. It was really facilities management. You had facilities within which independent physicians treated patients. We started to hire physicians mostly and nurses to own clinical processes. I think of it as a matrix with the hospital departments coming across and these things coming down. For the first time in our system, those approaches have a voice. I mean a formal organizational voice with data to back it up, and boy, it's made a difference. The second piece, imagine I'm capitated. We think that Intermountain's about 70% capitated right now, and it's gonna just get more. Um, that's true for any integrated system. In that capitated environment, if you bring me a method that's more effective at a population level, right, it makes perfect financial sense. Half of the problem that we all face is fee-for-service payment. It's actively perverse. I'm paid more to do more even if it's not beneficial. I'm paid more to harm my patients. Um, and we need to shift away from that fee-for-service system. Now, that's a big shift. But if you get your teeth into it, focus on it, you're going to find that it could do very, very well for you. You don't want to be one of those that's left behind screaming because you can't change on this one. Uh, I see that, for example, it's a long answer, but another important part. You know, we looked at what happened in surgical path, and I have a, one of our lead radiologists in the system who came by and said, you know, we could do that for radiology. Now, I have to have two things. I have to have the particular image that's performed, and I also have to have um, specifically what I'm looking for on the image, and then I can build synoptic elements. Faster, smoother, better, we think. Uh, Keith White's leading that for us right now. Uh, and it's kind of exciting. Um, he talks about a concept he calls a consulting radiologist. We've been asking, how does radiology really add value? We think that image assessment is commoditizing fairly rapidly, especially with digital imaging and the ability to ship it out. We think it's commoditizing. The idea, though, that a radiologist can come in and help a team know what images to get and what right questions to ask, that really adds value. Um, and I think that's a real opportunity for the future as well. One more question and then we gotta go. We, we're gonna have to take a break, but we can have people come up uh, to talk with uh, Dr. James. So microphone two and then we'll stop. Great talk. Uh, as you know, we're in an era of metrics mania where we are trying to measure everything. It's coming from insurers, it's coming from the government, it's coming internally from hospitals. Uh, it's usually a response to some problem that somebody institutes a new measurement. And it rarely is reflexive. We don't go back to look at whether whatever we imposed did what it was supposed to. The net result is that cumulatively, it seems like we're drowning in things that we have to fulfill to the point where we no longer have time to take care of patients. Any, yeah. any thoughts about how to, to react to that? I got to tell you, it's one of my major annoyances, too. Um, turns out that the fundamental idea is process management, so I identify a clinical process and use it to generate the data that I track around the process. It's the information you have to have to deliver the care, and if you do it well, it integrates, so it doesn't feel like an external burden. So you're talking about top-down measures coming down the chain from the government or from a health system management or an insurer, right? and they are unfunded burdens. When you do bottom-up measures, it turns out those guys get everything they need, and we get the stuff that we need. But the key is, is to build bottom-up, not top-down. So when you're doing clinical management of the sort I described, you identify those big clinical processes, and you build your data systems around them. You will get different data systems than what comes down from the top. Uh, it's a true annoyance, because what happens to me, these guys, impose these data and it actually competes with the good data you need for your care delivery. It sucks out all the resources, you see? Um, and the reason is, is that they won't build bottom up. We're in this town, well, right across the street. I lived in this hotel for a while, pretty close. I was asked along with eight others to staff what was called the Strategic Framework Board on the National Quality Forum. 
We took three years, we were tasked to do full evidence review IOM style and establish how NQF should build quality measures for the nation. We found a very rich evidence base. It turns out it's how you design data systems for randomized controlled trials. That's where most of the research was done. And we produced a report. It was a special issue of the Journal of Medical Care, a much more extensive report that we took back to the NQF board. They raised their hands and voted on it and accepted it, and they haven't followed it for a day since, um, which is a little frustrating. And what we recommended to them was that bottom-up build, right? Exactly what a clinician would want. I went home and, and I basically applied it inside Intermountain, and that's why we were successful. Right there, you see? That's what made it work. Um, now, Chris Cassells, a member of the SFB, just took over NQF, and she claimed she's going to straighten this out. And I'm going to be right there helping her every step of the way. But uh, you're spot on. We need to fix that. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I wish uh, thank you so much. I wish we could uh, continue this discussion, but unfortunately we have uh, many other things we have to do. I want to present uh, Dr. James with this plaque, which is, says, in appreciation of his significant contribution to the 90th ACRAMCLC. So thank you again. Let's, uh...